Hello everybody, my name's Campbell, I'm Head of Conservation and Research at the Hawke Conservancy Trust and I'm going to be talking to you today about white-headed vultures. I was given a, a number of, of reasons I'm supposed to describe of why I like white-headed vultures and I, I don't think I'm going to do it in a, in a list style, I don't think I'm going to rank them like number one is this, number ten is that or whatever. I think I'm just going to talk about white-headed vultures for a bit and explain why I like them. You may know already, vultures take up the biggest proportion of my time at the Hawke Conservancy Trust and white-headed vultures for a long time loomed very large on my landscape and I spent most of my time working on white-headed vultures. Um, I also like the relationship that they have with white back vultures. But anyway, I'm going to, I've am going i got some props here and I'm going to uh, use the props because they're better to look at than me and the uh, idea is to just run through not the list per se but to talk about white-headed vultures so one of the reasons I like them and here's my coming up my first prop is that to me they represent the model of the modern family and I say that and here's here's a picture of a white-headed vulture family um, I particularly like how much time and effort they put into building their nests compared to white-backed vultures which really aren't very good at building nests, white-backed vultures, white-headed vultures build these enormous nests sometimes. Uh, this bit here is actually made up of uh, the nests of a small weaver called the red-billed buffalo weaver. And one of the reasons I like that is that they have these apparently symbiotic, not quite symbiosis, but they, they live together. So sometimes the weavers will build with the vultures and then other time other times the vultures will build nests onto the weaver nests. So we're never quite sure which, which comes first. Uh, but here's the family. So here's the female. She's at nest there as the male is coming in, carrying uh, uh, some more nesting material. And this is a bird of the year. This is a pre-fledged chick. So they're still building their nest and hanging out there, even when the chick is uh, just about ready to fledge. And I mentioned there the modern family. The the thing that I find, or well, one of the reasons I like white-headeds, is that they share their nesting duties almost equally, almost completely equally in so much as the amount of time that the male and female will spend at the nest is over the course of the breeding season almost exactly equal so they share it um, down the middle. Lots of people imagine the female birds spend all the time in the nest and the males go off foraging uh, but certainly not with white-headed vultures that's not the case. And what's particularly interesting and what I find super cool is that the uh, the birds, the male and the female share their nest duties at different times of the day which is very very interesting and that um, makes us wonder why they would divide the duties into uh, different timings so uh, i've got some theories on that which i'll talk about in a moment but this is uh this is uh, uh, one of my favorite pictures here of white-headed vultures i was desperate to try and capture a picture of a white-headed vulture carrying something in its talons um, and that's important because vultures almost always carry stuff in their beak, nesting material in particular, um, whereas eagles tend to carry things in their talons. And I mention eagles because I've often referred to white-headed vultures not as vultures, and of course they are vultures taxonomically, but I say that they're more like an eagle masquerading as a vulture. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment. So this is an interesting thing about their breeding. They spend a lot of time rearing this this chick here. Uh, incubation time of nearly two months sitting on the egg. Again, the male and female share that equally. And then the chick's in the nest for over 100 days. So um, a good uh, over, th over three months before it fledges. So really, really long breeding cycle. So I think I'm going to move on now to the one of the other cool things about white-headed vultures. And that is, oh, here we go, that's this here. So just bear with me while I spend a bit of time explaining this. You can see the pattern on the back of this bird's wing here. These are called the median wing coverts. And if you look at these three birds here, they're all females and they're all at this carcass with this, these grubby white back vultures in the background. I should say I'm very fond of white back vultures too. But the point for this picture is to show that each one of these birds has a different pattern on its wing coverts. And what we did a few years ago, we published a paper showing that if you do an analysis, which we did of the individual patterns on each of the white-headed vultures, each bird has a unique pattern. Well, we 
to the best of our estimates, they're unique patterns. So the, the probability of this pattern here occurring on more than one bird is so low and the population of white-headed vultures is so low that the likelihood of that pattern reappearing is is almost is almost not uh, going to happen. And that was some interesting work. And what that suggests is that each of these birds is individually identifiable, a bit like fingerprints for humans. And you might, might ask, well, why would they be individually identifiable? And there's all sorts of reasons. These very, very bright patterns here, in biological terms, it could be an indicator of fitness. It could be a particularly good breeding bird. And it is quite interesting to see this very bright pattern here because the best white-headed vultures, I say best, in the most successful breeding white-headed vultures we have at the Hawke Conservancy Trust, Angus and Satara, they have, or uh, Satara in particular, has very, very bright wing coverts, which may suggest it's an indicator of fitness, but we don't know. The key thing is, though, that these birds are all individually identifiable. And there's lots of other animals that this has been done for. So elephants with notches in their ears, whisker spots on lions, all this type of thing. But it's it's very, very interesting with the with the white-headed vultures. So I mentioned before about the um, during the breeding season, the female and the male white-headed vultures share their time differently. So the females tend to leave the nest mainly during the middle of the day. Uh, not always, and the males tend to do that middle of the day shift and the females tend to do the the, uh, the early morning and the late evening. And one of the reasons they do that is because when white-headed vultures are foraging, the females spend much more time at carcasses than the males. So here's a picture here of uh, a classic picture, which is one of my favourite pictures of all time, actually. This is this female white-headed vulture in full I'm going to kick you into next week mode. Here's this poor white-backed vulture doing nothing except coming to a carcass. And here she comes. Female white-headed vultures really have it in for white-backed vultures at carcasses. So they go to carcasses more often than males and juveniles do. They eat more. They eat faster. They have more aggressive interactions with other vultures. And importantly, they flash their wing patches like this even more. So it's possible black and white's a really powerful contrasting image in the wild. And it's possible that females have these white wing patches here to have a more effective threat display compared to the males, which tend to hang around at the back of carcasses and don't have as many fights with white-backed vultures, which is quite interesting. So females, they're bigger, they're more aggressive, they get more food, and they feed faster at carcasses than males and juveniles, which is... Um, Another reason why I quite like them. And in actual fact, they'll often just bully white-backed vultures because they can, because they're bigger, they're stronger, and uh, there seems to be this very interesting interaction. And that brings us back again to the breeding side of things because we talk about individuals as birds. I mentioned about the individual identification of the birds here. Well, it's also relevant to their behaviour, which is super interesting because this pair of birds here... This is what's called Jacana pair. That's the name of the pair. And this was the most successful, i.e. they bred every year that I was monitoring white-headed vultures closely for about eight years. I had a chick every year and they were the only pair of birds that didn't move. Lots of other white-headed vultures end up, when they make a nest like this, the white-backed vultures will move in over here somewhere. They'll start using these other trees in the background and they move closer and closer and closer to the white headed vultures when they're breeding. And when that happens, the breeding productivity of the white-headed vultures goes down. They're not as successful. And the breeding productivity of the white-backed vultures goes up. So the closer a white-backed vulture breeds to a pair of birds like this, their, their success rate goes up, but these birds suffer. And I think that's why white-headed vultures don't like white-backed vultures very much. In fact, we've got another paper in preparation called There Goes the Neighbourhood. So when you've got a pair of white-headed vultures, the white-backed vultures move in, and from the white-headed vultures' perspective, the neighbourhood's gone to pot, and that's when they tend to move away. Except for pairs like Jacana pair. They fight this female here. She was more aggressive. You could see her at carcasses. She was always beating up white-backed vultures, and they didn't move. They stayed there for eight years, and they chased all the white-backed vultures away. Really, really interesting, and I love that individual variation with white 
headed vultures. <clears throat> so where do I go to now? Ah yes, yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about this aspect here, but also about the foraging behavior of the bird. So I've got another prop here. This is where it gets a little bit technical. You've got to bear with me here because uh, there's uh, less pictures of vultures and more technical pictures. So the first one I wanted to point out, I mentioned before about white-headed vultures are, are predatory and we published some work on this a few years ago. Um, all of these papers about white-headed vultures and our other work are available on the website if you want to read them. Some of them are a bit uh, long-winded and a bit, or um, well, they're a bit academic. Some of them they have to be when they get published in journals, but some of them are quite, I try to make papers as easily reading as possible. And one of the ones that we've got in preparation now is, is this here. What is that, you might ask? Well, we can see it's a talon, the shape of a talon. And what we do is a geometric analysis of the shape and curve and compression and thickness and all these morphological characteristics of white-headed vulture talons. And what we did was we compared that to around about 25 other species of birds of prey, not just vultures, but eagles and falcons and kites and, and all that type of thing, harriers even as well. And I was expecting originally, because I mentioned about the white-headed vultures being eagles in disguise, as it were, I suspected that the shape of the white-headed vulture talons were going to be very similar to eagles and not as similar to other vultures. Well, certainly the second part was right in so much as the shape of white-headed vulture talons is not the same as other vultures. But what's really weird is it's not even the same shape as eagle talons as well. White-headed vultures have a talon morphology, this shape here, all of their own. They're not actually related to any other birds, which I find particularly interesting, and it does lend weight to their predatory behavior. And so does the next table, or figure actually. This is the other really cool part about white-headed vultures. So this is a comparison, bear with me on this. This is a comparison of the visual field of trigonoceps, the white-headed vulture, and gyps vultures. And what this figure shows us is that as we look at the binocular field, comparing these two birds, so binocular field is when we can obviously see with both eyes, so our binocular field as humans goes back to our lateral vision. This part about I'm holding my hand above my head here, I can't see my hand because it's outside my visual field. And so on this figure here, that represents these areas here. So this here is directly above the bird's head. Without going into this for five minutes, which I probably could, the take home message from this particular figure, and we published again on this a few years ago with some colleagues from Royal Holloway and, and University of Birmingham. The visual field of the white headed vulture is much wider, significantly wider than white backed vultures, which would lend support to a predatory lifestyle. The white backed vultures have much better lateral vision, which suggests that they're more interested in looking at what their friends are doing and if they've found a carcass compared to the white-headed vulture, which is more focused perhaps on a predatory mode of foraging. So some super interesting stuff here. This I, I'm regretting my decision to include this figure now because it's more difficult to explain than I thought it was going to be. This one, nice and straightforward. Curve of the talons, everybody can see that. This one here, much more difficult to explain. Take home message is white-headed vultures have a bigger binocular field than the gyps vultures, which suggests more a predatory style of foraging. So I'm just looking at the timer here, and I've talked about white-headed vultures for nearly 15 minutes, which was unexpected. There's a whole lot of other reasons. In fact, I'm going to suggest now maybe I should do another session on white-headed vultures in another one of these, um, I presume it's a podcast or something like that. Uh, so yeah, maybe stay tuned. I'll do a, a part two of white-headed vultures and some of the other interesting features about them. And um, I look forward to talking to you about then. So like I said, all of these papers and a lot of our results are available on the website. And uh, obviously the work is continuing when the uh, pandemic passes and we can get back into the field. And uh, if you're keen in the meantime, have a look at the website, have a look at some of our other projects, of which there are many, which we're continuing and uh, yes, I look forward to talking to you again soon.